there, Jamaica. It's the sunniest of days. So sit back and put your feet up. We're glad you've chosen to turn your TV on to the show with meaningful information. Now hide that remote. You need no distraction. If you're watching from your mobile, even better. Prepare to be informed and entertained for the next half hour. Hello and welcome to Jamaica Magazine. I'm your host, Adrian Atkinson. More after this break. One of the problems that occurred in the past was the delay, significant delay in the issuing of warrants for persons who did not pay at the tax office and did not attend the court. And so what happened there was that a culture of impunity had developed where persons felt that when they received a ticket from the police, they could simply ignore it. So where we are now is that we are now current with the issuing of warrants in respect of the current cases. So what that means is that for persons who do not pay at the tax office, don't attend the court, the warrants are being issued and will be issued and you will be arrested and brought before the court. If you do not wish to come to court, then go to the tax office. Also, you have the option of contesting it. So you don't pay at the tax office, but you must turn up at court on the date and time stated in the summons. Failing that, a warrant will be issued and you will be brought before the court. Now, on to those who are still reeling from the effects of Hurricane Beryl, particularly the students from those schools that were damaged during the passage of the July 3rd storm. We are keen to know what is being done to rectify these issues and ensure a smooth transition into the new school year. Mrs. Latoya harris Gotti, Executive Director of the National Education Trust, stopped by to give us the facts. Let's listen in. Welcome to Get the Facts, the program that provides you with information on government's policies and initiatives. I'm Theodore Henry. The new academic year is just around the corner, but as schools get ready, some are facing the added challenge of rebuilding from the damage caused by Hurricane Beryl. Fortunately, the Ministry of Education and Youth, through the National Education Trust, NET, has been diligently working to get these institutions ready. So, how is the recovery progressing? To shed light on that, we have with us Latoya harris Garty, the Executive Director of the National Education Trust. Welcome to the program, Mrs. harris Garty. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. Let's jump right into getting some facts. Can you give us an overview of the damage to schools caused by Beryl? Um, well, there are 330 schools uh, estimated right now, well, as of Monday, to be $3.5 billion in damage. Ooh. What we've done, we've sort of prioritized each school. So we have the schools broken down into priority one, priority two, priority three. Priority one being those that must, absolutely must, mm -hmm. work need to start like okay. the week after burial hit um, in order to be ready for school year. And priority two, uh, moderate hit, and then priority three, um, damage but can operate and we can have school while work is going on in both priority two and priority three okay. and a lot of the work um, on those two categories uh, being undertaken in the ministry's regional um, offices mm -hmm. in conjunction with schools who have the capacity to undertake that of course with some technical guidance to ensure that we get in the best quality for the money spent. Important, important. <laughs> right. so, so, so you've given us the, the whole breaking down and the assessment. Uh, what else is contained in the scope of NET's response? So for our response is largely with the priority one schools. Oh. Um, and we are sharing that responsibility with the technical unit of the ministry because there are 100 schools now as of Monday. In it, priority one? Yes, it oh. was 94 when the minister last reported. It's now at 100 schools. Um, and hopefully <laughs> it remains a hundred because of course because of the nature of it you know right. we want those schools to be ready for september so we don't want that number climbing anymore Definitely. um and that is at basically two billion dollars and what we're doing with those or work has started at 68 of those schools 
and work should commence by the end of this week at the remaining schools. So we, prior to burial, when we realized the potential impact, we did have some precautionary measures put in place in terms of um, uh, procurement preemptive approval from the PS uh -huh. for emergency. Right, right. Um, in initialization of emergency works mm -hmm. and uh, from that we are able to get basically an assessment of um, a rough assessment initially a more detailed assessment throughout the, the period following burial and we basically initiated the emergency procurement right. um, had contractors visit most of the sites. There are a few that we didn't get responses to initially, and I guess that would be one of the, the stumbling blocks for not starting in all 100. Yeah, well, yeah. I shouldn't say all, well, all 94 that was initially um, right. identified. The, the additional schools were added once we went through some assessments and realized that, hey, you're not a category two, you're actually a priority oh, one. Right. Um, so, uh, it was following all of those things falling in line. We, we basically have started work in the six to eight schools. Um, some are slated to finish in around the first week. I think I have one that's actually finishing in, in, in August. Right. <laughs> one school of the 100, I but mean, we'll take it. it's staying. Right. Um, but a lot of them are finishing the first week of September, which uh, what, we've, what we're doing with the schools is to say, the contract and the schools to work out those areas that are mission critical right. to opening the doors, mm -hmm. um, finish those works, and then you can do the fine tuning, clean up, and all of those things to, to put that cherry on top, um, to have it done within the timeline. Um, there's some schools that work will still continue. Uh, so like I know I've seen some September 19th deadlines um, in terms of completion. Um, and it's just ensuring that we have uh, open lines of communication between the project managers, the, the principal, the chairman, um, the ministry personnel, and that we work with the principal to ensure that those areas that he or she has identified as being priority for opening, yeah, those are kept down. All right, so so that's pretty much Comprehensive effort. Yes. But uh, okay, so the the number you gave me uh, for the current status was sixty eight. Was sixty eight has started work. Right. So work is ongoing actively in sixty eight. Right. There are about um, ten of those that they would have gotten uh, possession of site, um, uh, and that would have been probably on Tuesday. Right. Some persons indicated they would have started with a holiday, not Tuesday, on Monday. <laughs> but, but the question the question I have though is, uh, so would you be able to share the challenges that, that NET is experiencing with the, the balance? Right, so uh, part of the challenge is for the emergency works, one of the guidance that we got from the Public Procurement Commission is that, you know, since we're doing a lot of sole source, we should try not to have more than one uh, one contractor getting multiple. So you, you have you will limited the contractors to like two, unless it was that we saw that the contractor was performing. So like I mentioned that there's one school mm -hmm. that is finishing in August, and that contractor said, "Hey, I have two teams freed up, come then." So I can okay. and you're performing. So Get I need the schools. Right. <laughs> so then we would we would give we would award more than one contract to a contractor um, it is having the contractors the sufficient number of contractors in the required grade because you know each contract is registered um, between a grade one and grade three is what right. we're primarily working with um, access in the areas for some for some schools I know there's one school that part of the issue was uh, GPS line being down and it might have been active so that was so one of the issues right a bit to go through. Um, okay. uh, but I think that school actually started work on the week well on the weekend so we I'm, think I want to come back to this but we're <laughs> going to take a break right All now right. we're still talking about uh, recovery of schools in time for September morning so we're at the break but stay with us we'll be right back We are hoping that the time will come to be able to track these cards. Hello, hello, the house are burned down. And punish those who are, who, are, who are doing this. All too frequently, a unit is unavailable for an actual fire emergency. 
merely because it is responding to a false alarm. And it, 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 it results in most instances to a waste of resources, resources that could be used um, for more productive um, purposes. So I want to encourage members of the public to desist from this practice. Welcome back to Get the Facts. We're discussing the rebuilding and the recovery efforts for schools damaged by Hurricane Beryl. Our guest is Latoya harris Garty, Executive Director of the National Education Trust. Lady harris Garty, you were discussing the schools. We had touched on uh, how we're going forward with the balance that have not been started just as yet. And uh, even during the break, we were discussing how there might be and there are supply shortages because other people are looking for this. Right. <laughs> so the question I have for you is, you have those challenges, but how, how is the, the net strategizing to get around them? Are there any international partnerships that can help out, that sort of thing? So we have reached out and through the Planning Institute of Jamaica and uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Right. Um, the message is really out there in terms of what our needs are. We have collated from some of the schools. So we have a spreadsheet that we've sent to the system for the schools to update and say what they need. Um, and Sorry, I know can I jump in here? What are you seeing on that spreadsheet? Like uh, a lot of the needs on that um, equipment, such as ICT equipment, um, furniture, that's, that, that's pretty much um, where a lot, you know, student desk and chairs, some teacher desk and chairs, uh, ICT, as I said before, that's right. primarily the, the areas that we've seen coming out. Okay. Um, I know some of the schools have been challenged uploading the information because in some of the areas that were hardest hit, they still right. don't have internet right. Right. Uh, connectivity that's stable. But the information has been flowing, especially with, with some of the schools that we work with because we not just do infrastructure work, we also, we're a registered charitable organization. So there's our donor aspect, mm -hmm. and that aspect is coordinating with, with partners um, to ensure that we don't have duplications in the system and that the resources get here. Right. So like even persons who want to ship to schools, you know, it's important that you contact NET because the waivers that will be applied mm -hmm. can only be applied yeah, through a registered right. charitable organization, so right. yes. So, so there is there is some some movement on the horizon, mm -hmm. and uh, the goal is all 100 of the the, the phase one. Yes, yes, yes. So the, the the goal is by September we should have the 100 schools significantly um, ready for September morning. Right. Some of them will have work ongoing. You know, when you think about schools like Monroe, for example, you see where. Work will have to go on during school, but the critical areas have to be ready for September morning. Totally understood. Mm -hmm. You did cover, you did cover uh, in the first segment how NET is dealing with um, the rebuilding process and making it effective when you spoke mm -hmm. about the whole contractors not giving everybody too much work. But the, we have had conversations on this platform and certainly at a national level. This is going to be, as it has always been for the last few years, an above average hurricane season. So Beryl has come, Beryl has gone. You're going to get everything done and recovered for September. But the next one and the next one, what are the long-term plans well, that is putting in place? One, we're working on an um, infrastructure policy for the ministry, and that's a joint effort with the Ministry of Education. Right. We're also working on building standards. So we are very far advanced right. in the building standards, and the building standards covers early childhood to secondary level. Um, we've reviewed the secondary level, we've approved it, and the final deliverable is set for this month. So the Ministry of Education will have brand new building standards. In those building standards, we've looked at green energy, um, green building technology. Right. Um, you know, we're looking at water harvesting, we're looking at solar. Uh, we've really taken recommendations from Orlando Patterson and we've put we've put those and incorporated those into the standards. And just for our guests, uh, give me some context for Orlando Patterson. So, oh, <laughs> so that's a transformation. We call it transformation report right. um, that basically outlines what are the what are the areas that we need to be hitting in terms of fixing education and transforming gotcha. education. And you know, out of the recommendations, infrastructure was at, is pillar six, mm -hmm. and it is probably the one with the longest 
Yeah, runway to completion. Runway to right. completion and cost. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, a lot of the schools that were hit and we see the damage, it's uh, because maintenance hasn't been the greatest. Um, that's one. Uh, some of them are old. You know, you look at um, Westwood, Manu, Mannings, those are schools that have more than 100 years yeah, old in history right there. Right. Um, and they've withstood lots of hurricanes, but I guess they're, it's, they're due for a refresh. And uh, part, of, part of the infrastructure, we have the policy, we have the strategy that we're working on. Um, and part of the strategy is for all our schools at some point um, over the next five to 10 years to have a refresh um, utilizing the building standards. So you know Jamaica has new building codes right. and all of those underpin the, the building standards that we have now. So we're rolling out new building standards. Oh, okay. but if you look at our new sc our newer schools, mm -hmm. they're not, they weren't really damaged. Uh, um, you know. So, so that, that's you just sneaking a little, <laughs> hey, the building standards are successful, you know? It, 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 it really is. Yeah. Um, it, we, we, we listen to the stakeholders. You know, heat was a problem. You know, mm. We increase in the height of the the, the, right. the the ceiling for the floor to foot mm -hmm. um, for cross ventilation to make the place cooler. Different things. Um, I know the person say we shouldn't use the louver windows, but in our in our climate, louver windows provide light and air to flow through. So right. it might just be that the the sturdiness of the ones that we we need we're using need to right. be focused on. So. The, the key is um, transitioning our infrastructure, utilizing the building standards that are now going to come into place, right. and also ensuring that we adhere to those standards. Got it, got it. Sounds like a great time to be a student. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Well, we, we, we are looking forward to all of that being done, especially for September morning. We know you're on the job, you've mm -hmm. explained what the net is doing. But we're in the final few seconds of the interview and our guests, our, our audience, they're, they're watching. Uh, students, parents, teachers, they've heard you. And I don't know if there's anything that you'd like to say directly to them in these last few seconds. Um, I would just say, especially to our parents, um, the private sector, Anybody who wants to give to education, uh, become part of our invested village. Um, join the National Education Trust. We're a registered charitable organization. I have to stress that because it, that comes with certain level of accountability for what you give us and how you give to us. Uh, info at net.org.jm is an email that goes to our donor team to help any assistance in terms of if the schools are bringing in things, if you want to send things to your school. Um, for updates, we are currently updating our burial page on our website, which is net.org.jm. And that should have information on the needs of our schools based upon the feedback we're getting from them. Hmm. Thank you so much. So this has been Get the Facts. Our guest has been Latoya harris Garty, Executive Director of the National Education Trust. Thank you for watching. And you know what she did say? Be a part of the solution. Buy into the structures that have been set up and help us recover from this and future events. Until next time, I'm Theodore Henry. Do take care. Christmas, they say, comes only once per year, but this is not so, at least not for the Ministry of Tourism, which has been hosting its annual Christmas in July trade show for the past 10 years. If you ask them, there is Christmas and there is Christmas in July. The trade show had its 10th showing early last month. Here now is a peek into the happenings. It's not quite the Yuletide season, but the excitement and the extravagance that usually comes with that period sure is present at the National Arena today. It's Christmas in July, the trade show brought to you by the Ministry of Tourism and its affiliates.
July represents an arena for the showcasing of your products. But it also is a marketplace because what it does is to bring buyers and sellers together. And over 400 of you have been participating and some $25 million of business was done last year and we're expecting that you will do better this year. The two-day held trade show had a new venue this year at the National Arena. It featured a variety of products ranging from souvenirs, fashion and accessories, to fine arts or decor, processed foods and of course aromatherapy. And due to its new venue, the event became its largest showing ever, accommodating 205 of the 400 entrepreneurs that applied. Of that number, 106 of them were newcomers, stirring the pot for renewal within the trade show and new opportunities. That is very important, especially that they are young people. And that is creating the refreshing and the renewal. So if the industry is dynamic, then it morphs. And as we morph the new minds, with the new abilities, the new skills, the new technologies are coming into play. And that augurs well for the future of the whole small and medium development strategy that we are pursuing. My dream of being here has been a reality because I've tried the first time and I just didn't go through with it. But this time I'm here and I'm ready. What I hope to get from this experience is a chance to push my fruitcakes. I know they're delicious, I know they're moist, and I want to get into the international market. That has always been my aim. And so I'm hoping that this event will propel me to the next stage. Richard Smith was about 15 years old when the first Christmas in July trade show was held. Now an entrepreneur and a booth holder, he recalls his feeling patronizing the show back then. I passed through one number of years um, looking at the space and when I was younger, actually, you know, probably looking at the future, sorry, right, one day I must come here, you know, sort of thing. So, and I'm here now. Talk about speaking things into being. After checking out the young artist's work, we decided to see for ourselves what he was about. Not bad for a portrait done in approximately 20 minutes. The activity drew onlookers as well as interested parties, an important part of networking, something first time a Fiona Hall knows about. One of the things that I really would like to highlight for my small business owners is to let them know that networking, which is what we're doing here today, is way more valuable than a sale. Networking will see you making an order for a hundred pieces versus someone walking by and taking up a piece here, a piece there. So it's the difference of making a hundred thousand versus five hundred thousand. And that is just a taste of what one can expect from being a part of the Christmas in July trade show. Ronita Crooks has been at the event several times and knows what newcomers can expect from the exposure. Newcomers can expect a lot of persons reaching out to them and to expand their business. Sometimes they will offer assistance as in grants. Sometimes they will give you more advice on how you can expand your business more. There's a large number of manufacturers this year. But what makes it um, special for us is the impact that we know the unit is able to make on the lives of small manufacturers in Jamaica. A team is always good when you are able to produce and show something of this magnitude that benefits not only small manufacturers but Jamaica. And the entrepreneurs were indeed grateful for the hard work of the Tourism Linkages Network. Gratitude they didn't mind sharing. I would like to say to the government, thank you. They have been doing a great job for us in terms of they have a co-op program now where over time for persons who come to Christmas in July, they buy our items, they will pay attention to them, sample them, and they came up with a cohort where they want us to go into the hotel industry and in terms of using Jamaican made products in the industry. I love government events, which makes sense. If you want to expose yourself a certain type of way, you have to tap into the expos or the events that they cater to small businesses like us. Repeat business is also a feature of the trade show. And that's why we have a number of repeat manufacturers. This year, in fact, we had 99. 
because despite you coming the first time and you have gone through our growth processes and we have taken you through our different programs, persons have acknowledged the benefits and remain a part of the program. So the, the feedback is always great in terms of earnings and exposure. I've been attending the Christmas in July for five years and we are literally five years old. Being a part of Christmas in July offers the opportunity for us suppliers to meet buyers and I can proudly say that Paris Ruby have been a beneficiary of that in which we are now looking to be in the hotels pretty soon. This is our fourth time participating in Christmas in July and every time we participate it's been a success for us. We do find that our brand increases whenever we participate in Christmas in July. A number of people will contact us through our social media platforms to say that they saw us, they met us at Christmas in July or they heard about us or they saw our products in the Christmas catalogue that comes out after the staging of Christmas in July. The new venue offers a wider space, something that the manufacturers are loving. This year is a lot better, a lot more space. We're, e we're able to engage with our customers more freely and more comfortably. Each year there are new ideas. Persons get more creative as the year um, goes by. And we want to always see new manufacturers coming up with new ideas. Um, the, the appetite for buyers is always large and they're always ready to see new stuff. So we encourage persons who are creating to always um, come on board with us because we have a platform, we have, a, we have space for you in tourism where we can always showcase your items. We have seen a constant improvement every year. The number of participants have expanded every year. Um, the level of business that is done um, has also increased over there. We are expecting to significantly improve on that. But while we are doing that, we are also expanding the growth of tourism, which means the demand for more of these goods and, um, and services too from our small and medium enterprises is expanding and we have to respond to it. And with that, we've come to the end of today's show. To catch a repeat of this or any other, feel free to log on to our website jis.gov.jm Until next time, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Do take care. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica. Jamaica.